The Martin MB-1 was the first dedicated bombing aircraft designed and built by the United States. During the first months of American involvement in the First World War, the US military had to rely on warplanes that were supplied by its European allies. Up until this point, the Army's interest in aviation had been lukewarm at best, and its small air force, the aviation section of the US Signal Corps, was nothing in comparison to those being fielded by the Europeans. For example, by the end of 1914, the aviation section had just 224 men, 44 officers, and 23 aircraft. In comparison, at the outbreak of war, five months earlier, the largest air forces in Europe, those of France, Germany, and Russia, had upwards of 250 aircraft each at their disposal. This disparity continued at the same ratio throughout the war, so that by mid-1917, the US was fielding some 230 or 240 military aircraft, while those in Europe were fielding over two or 3,000. Thus, when the United States entered the war, its industry was not quite ready to cope with the sudden explosion of demand, hence the rapid acquisition of European hardware. But that was not to say that the industry was unwilling. And so, when the Army issued a requirement for a new bomber that could match the equivalent British Hanley Page Type O, the newly formed Glenn L. Martin Company immediately got to work. Martin proposed a twin-engine bomber that was to be powered by the new 400 horsepower Liberty engine. It was to be a multi-bay biplane that would have a wingspan of 71 feet 5 inches, or 21.7 meters, a length of 44 feet 10 inches, or 13.6 meters, and a height of 14 feet 7 inches, or 4.5 meters. Empty, it would weigh approximately 6,500 pounds, or just under 3 tons, and it was to have a base crew of three a pilot, a bombardier, and a gunner, plus additional gunners if required. Its payload was to be approximately 1,000 pounds, or 453 kilos, and a maximum speed of at least 110 miles an hour, or 177 kilometers an hour, was expected. The proposed bomb load was smaller than that of the Hadley Page, but the speed was better, and, as the army had received no other favourable submissions thus far, it gave Martin an initial contract to produce six aircraft in January of 1918. Designated as the MB-1, or Martin Bomber-1, its development involved three people who would soon become household names in American aviation. Glenn Martin himself organised the endeavour, he brought in Donald Douglas as the lead designer, and Lawrence Bell was put in charge of the construction and management of the new factory that would be building these aircraft. This factory, erected in Cleveland, Ohio, was built in just 45 days, and the first aircraft was ready to fly just six months later. Before this first aircraft had even flown, the scope of the design had been expanded, mostly in anticipation of a major offensive that was being planned against Germany for 1919. Plans for four different types of the aircraft had by this point been approved. A night bomber with a 1,500 pound payload and three defensive Lewis guns. A day bomber with a 1,000 pound payload and five defensive guns. An observation plane with two cameras and up to five defensive guns. And finally, a so-called gun carrier, which was to mount a 37mm cannon plus five machine guns. The first aircraft made its maiden flight on the 17th of August 1918. It performed well during the initial test flights, allegedly achieving a top speed of 118 miles an hour, or just under 190 kilometers per hour, though sources do conflict on this. And this performance prompted the army to increase their order by another 50 airframes. It's not known how this order was split, in terms of aircraft configuration, as just two months later it was reduced to just 10 aircraft in total following the collapse of the Central Powers, and the likely chance of a ceasefire before Christmas. In the end, just 20 versions of the MB-1 would be produced, and they varied widely in their configurations. 
Of the initial order of 10 aircraft for the army, the first four were not delivered as bombers at all, but were instead heavily armed reconnaissance planes, fielding five machine guns and a light bomb load of just 220 pounds. Designated as the GMB-G, they lived something of an aimless life, with the army not really knowing what to do with them. One was used for further flight testing, and then completed a record-setting series of flights around the rim of the continental United States, covering 9,800 miles between July and November of 1919. Another was sent straight off to the Smithsonian to be put on a display, because why not? Apparently the army had no real use for it, and the fate of the other two is relatively unknown. The next three aircraft were delivered as dedicated night bombers as originally intended, fielding an increased bomb load of 1,500 pounds. But this reduced the top speed to just under 100 miles an hour. Following this, the last three aircraft of the original Order for 10 were each of them unique. The eighth aircraft was modified for an attempt to cross the Atlantic Ocean, being redesignated as the GMBTA but this aircraft was destroyed during a storm in July of 1919 before the attempt was made. The ninth was the sole example of the gun carrier version that was ever built, and it was used as a testbed to test the feasibility of the 37mm cannon as an air-to-air -air weapon. Per a company memo, the idea was that a single hit from this weapon could blow an enemy airship or aircraft out of the sky, of course, you first had to hit said airship or aircraft, and with accuracy being what it was back then, it basically meant getting your aircraft to within pistol shot, by which point a boarding action might as well be contemplated instead. The 10th MB-1 was completed as the GMT, which was a 12-seat passenger transport, and it was deployed to McCook Field. This aircraft was later redesignated as the T-1, or Transport-1, and although it appears to have been used as a military transport, the only photograph of this use was when it was transporting the McCook Field baseball team. Following the cutdown of the orders, the Glen Martin Company could have been in real financial trouble after it had invested so much into its new factory, but some additional orders did trickle in. Six versions of the MB-1 were ordered as mail planes in 1919, easily distinguished by their rounded nose. These could carry up to 1,500 pounds of mail, and were put into service on the New York-Chicago air route. Four were lost due to poor weather or accidents in the first year of service, and no replacement orders would follow. The Navy ordered two planes as experimental torpedo bombers, known as the MBT, which were delivered in 1920. These were designed to carry a 1,650-pound torpedo under the fuselage, and were expected to have a range of approximately 350 nautical miles. Following successful testing, a further eight aircraft were ordered as the MT. The Navy operated four of these out of San Diego, and the remaining six were transferred over to the Marine Corps. When the Navy standardised its designation system in 1922, these aircraft were all redesignated as the TM-1, and they remained in service for quite a long time, not being retired until 1928. The MB-1 and its various derivatives, though small in number, were considered a major success. Not only were they the first all-American designed bomber, but they performed remarkably well for a first attempt at such a machine. Unfortunately, their success did not immediately translate into a flurry of further orders, owing to the post-war budget cuts, and this put Martin in a bad spot. Considerable capital had been outlaid on the construction of the Cleveland factory, and the cost of producing the aircraft had increased by almost 50% of the original estimate, going from $50,000 per plane to just under $85,000. The company had not made a loss on the aircraft themselves, thanks to the generous contract that had been signed with the army, but it would be making a huge loss on the factory if things didn't change, and Glenn Martin found himself scrambling to find either more customers or more money in the form of bank loans. 
But just as things were beginning to look quite bleak, the army returned with a new order that helped to keep Martin solvent. And much of this was thanks to bomber enthusiast Brigadier General Billy Mitchell. He had been impressed by the MB-1, and Martin was commissioned to produce an improved version, with the army placing an initial order for 20 aircraft and a half-committed promise to many more. The result would be the highly successful MB-2, which would become the standard bomber for the Army Air Service in the early 1920s. But that is a topic for another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the patrons. This video was recorded at the same time as the last, so this list is completely identical, but it will be updated in the next video when it goes live. A big thank you of course to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members, and if you're noticing a theme with the overview videos recently, you would be correct. I'm trying to cover some of the more important or quirky 1920s military designs so that I can then do those from the 1930s and thus wrap up the bulk of the interwar period. Funnily enough, I want to get stuck into military aircraft produced before and after that era as well, so stay tuned for more. But as always, thank you all so much for your continued support, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.